Hello, it's Scott Manley here in Montreal, Canada. Uh, yeah, this is where we came to see the eclipse and the eclipse delivered, which is surprising because like the day before we arrived, there was like a foot of snow dropped on the city. Uh, but it, ultimately it all worked out. You know, Texas was going to be an absolute disaster. Uh, it looked like, you know, a few days beforehand, it was very clear it was going to be super cloudy and uh, we just noped out at the last minute and instead uh, I let Amy, I showed Amy the map and she said, I want to go to Montreal. I hear there's lots of places to eat and boy, there's lots of places to eat. Like, uh, I have eaten way too much. So yes, my great 2024 eclipse trip turned into something vastly different than I had envisaged. Originally, the plan was to be down in Fredericksburg, Texas, which all the eclipse watchers had said was going to be the perfect, most pristine place to see it. In fact, the Planetary Society had set up their big party for this location, uh, featuring, of course, Bill Nye and Tim Dodd, Ed Everyday Astronaut, on stage. As it was happening, uh, yeah, th they got a lot of clouds. I mean, it's the nature of chaotic systems. Uh, we can predict the moon thousands of years in advance, but the weather has many more variables, and we're lucky if we can get good predictions a week in advance. But there are smart and helpful people that have gone out and crunched the numbers, and they figure out the average cloud cover for the month of April. And, you know, here's the nice little graph, which you can see that if you're going to be in the US, best chance was, in fact, in Texas with a 50% chance of good skies, whereas up where I was, there was only a 20% chance. But once we started getting within 10 days, the predictions really became clear. But you know, it was kind of funny when I mentioned that, oh yeah, I'm going to go to Montreal, people were telling me, are you kidding? There's a snowstorm up there right now. That'll never be clear for Monday. Coincidentally, April 8th, 2023 was the same day I passed my private pilot check ride, and yeah, you can bet that I had been very carefully watching the weather to make sure I was going to be able to get out underneath the clouds and you know, do everything that I needed to do. So I had learned that, yes, you can, in fact, trust predictions made several days in advance. So we went for it. But in doing so, we did give up one very important thing. We, we lost a chunk of totality. So in Texas, it was going to be like four minutes and 26 seconds. That's long enough to listen to Bonnie Tyler's Total Eclipse of the Heart. Whereas in Canada, it was going to be about three minutes. And in fact, in Montreal, where Amy wanted to go with the great food, the duration was expected to be more like 90 seconds. But when I mentioned I was going to Montreal to see the eclipse... Lots of people on the internet came forward wanting to say hi, and one guy, Nicholas, said he would actually drive me and my family to his little chalet, closer to this center of the eclipse, so we could fully enjoy the maximum duration possible. As it turned out, that never happened. However, as we were flying to Las Vegas, not only did we see the giant sphere looking like a moon, I guess, because of the eclipse, we saw a SpaceX launch out of Vandenberg, and I'd completely forgot that this was going to happen, because we actually had to change flights at the last minute. We had to bring our flight forward by four hours so that we could make our connection. And that meant we landed about 7.30, where it was still light in California, but where we were, it was dark enough that we could actually see the first and the second stage ascending into the sky. Unfortunately, I didn't get great photographs because I only noticed it too late. But yeah, from Vegas, we went to Montreal. The weather was, as predicted, fantastic. And so was the food, and we were surrounded by arts and architecture and diehard references. And unfortunately, Orion had got sick. So we couldn't follow up with this uh, kind offer to drive down south and get good long views of the eclipse. Instead, we were going to have to live with, uh, you know, 87 seconds near the Science Centre, which apparently is a great place to take the kids. Then they were helping put on a giant show at uh, the waterfront, including this very realistic model of a comet and free Tim Hortons coffee. So let's look again at the weather from the actual eclipse using images from the GOES-16 uh, satellite in geostationary orbit. So yeah, you can see it coming up over through Mexico, through the US and into Canada. And if you, of course, put the lines over to make it a little easier for you to see where the countries are, you can see that actually, yeah, the coast of Mexico looked like it had it pretty good. Most of the middle of the US actually had clear sections and then Canada looked very clear. Zooming in, we actually have the mesoscale map, which runs at like five minute time steps. And yeah, again, you can see that Mexico had it very clear on the coast as it arrived. Southwest Texas was in trouble. It started to clear up around Dallas into Arkansas, Missouri, Indiana, 
Uh, things were looking great up there, and then it got cloudy again before clearing up in the northeast. And so for reference, I was up here. You can see the island which Montreal is on, and you can also see a high layer of cloud was moving in before the eclipse actually arrived. I saw the prediction of the clouds and I was getting a little concerned because, of course, at this point with Orion sick, I couldn't travel anywhere, I was stuck, and I had to accept what it gave me. But then I saw that the clouds would be at 25,000 feet and in the end, I think the clouds actually somewhat enhanced the experience just a little. Now, I'd love to say that I got some amazing photos and yeah, I did have a decent camera with decent filters, but actually I'm a kind of crappy photographer. Still, nevertheless, I did get some uh, you know, views of the you know, moon on the way into eclipse. And one thing I want to do for a second is to compare this against the photo I took like six months ago of the annular eclipse. And sure, it was cloudy, but it was nice to get and see that. But if I put this image side by side with the images from the day, you can see that the moon is very obviously smaller in the annular eclipse. And that's because in the six months that the Earth has moved around the Sun, the line between the Earth and the Sun has effectively moved through 180 degrees. So the position of the Moon has moved 180 degrees through its orbit. This is at opposite points. So during the annular eclipse, it was close to apogee, furthest point from the Earth. And during the total eclipse, it's closer to perigee, the closest point to the Earth. And that is why the, you know, these eclipses happen with some are annular and some are total. So anyway, about those clouds, they just happen to make a pretty good solar halo in the run up to the eclipse. And obviously I took this picture with the Canadian flag in line so that, uh, well, I could get extra retweet from Canadians. I do actually have a Canadian ancestor who moved to Canada and then moved back to Scotland. So yeah, this is something of an ancestral homecoming for me. And so while I was thousands of miles where I had intended and hoped to be, and 50 miles away from the center of eclipse that would have given me the best view, I was you know, surrounded by lots of people that were absolutely fascinated by this scientific event. And that felt exceptionally cool because in Oregon, I could hear the animals and everything react. I, here, I could hear the entire city react. And so I think my favorite photo was actually the video I took of totality happening. So I'm going to shut up for a minute, but while you're watching this, pay attention to the shadow moving in from the left. Oh, the plane has turned on its night lights to be legal. Yeah, and so look, the halo is half disappearing. The halo is disappearing as the, the shadow is coming across. Oh shit, you can see the shadow! You see the stars? Yes! There's a star right there. Do you see the shadow disappearing? Wasn't that cool? The previous solar eclipse I'd seen in 2017 had perfectly clear skies, and so you didn't see the shadow moving across. And that was a, a great thing from my point of view. But also, you know, the shadow cut out the halo as it moved across. And naively, you might think, well, the halo is from the light in the center, so it should wait. But actually, the halo is made of light scattered from crystals, and so when they lose the light of the moon, they are eclipsed too. But anyway, that was nice considering that all the other photos I took were kind of garbage. I um, didn't have much time, messed up the exposure, didn't have it set right, uh, turned the wrong dial, and also at one point I took a look around me and saw all these thousands of people wearing eclipse glasses and looking at totality, and I screamed at the top of my lungs as that, you know, annoying foreigner, TAKE YOUR GLASSES OFF, YOU'RE NOT SUPPOSED TO USE THEM FOR THIS BIT. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, if you look at the 7 o'clock position, you can see there's a small sort of pinkish intrusion. And I was very happy that I actually caught that with my uh, terrible skills, because there was a very visible solar prominence that was pink. That people could see with their naked eyes. People that didn't know anything about the solar corona, so I knew it wasn't just me imagining things. You can see it here in the bottom right in the NASA live stream. And then it was over, but straight afterwards we did get this cool shot of a, 
uh, an aircraft flying over above the clouds and its contrail casting a shadow down onto the thin layer of clouds. Looking at the aircraft tracking, I figured out that it was a, an, a, an Airbus A380 from Emirates and it had taken off from Toronto you know, a little while earlier. And, you know, a lot of the crowd were stopping to take photos of this as well. I'm wondering how many of them thought that this was a phenomenon that was unique to the eclipse rather than just being peculiar to thin high clouds. SpaceX shared this amazing sequence from a Starlink satellite that was flying across. Yeah, you know, uh, while the Starlink satellites are, of course, about communications, engineering cameras are pretty small and cheap these days, especially in a satellite which has plenty of bandwidth. There were a huge number of satellites publishing imagery from the solar eclipse, but you know what's cooler than a satellite publishing footage for the solar eclipse? It's a space station, because you know what? There are people on the space station viewing it, and they have their own real-time reactions. Wow, look at that. Holy oh cow. You guys, get over here. Come in. Awesome. Can you wow, see it? this is... Can you see it, Mike? <laughs> Unbelievable. That is what I've always wanted to see right there. This one's also great for me because it's pretty close to where I was. Those high altitude clouds on the right side were the same ones that I was viewing the eclipse through. Would have been cool if the space station was a few minutes earlier because then we might have been able to see this uh, flyover. And yeah, speaking of flyovers, uh, yeah, I did point out that there was a guy in a light aircraft flying around. Well, I used, you know, tracking data from light aircraft and compiling a time lapse showing 24 hours of small plane motions across the US on April 8th. And you can see that the line where the eclipse is going to be because there's a whole lot of planes flying into that area. Many of them are landing and stopping on the ground, but as we get closer to the time, a bunch of them will decide to stay in the air and go to high altitudes. That's why their icons turn green. And then, of course, as soon as the eclipse ends, they all head home, and all those aircraft that are on the ground, they head home. Apparently, it was very hard to get, like, flight following and activate flight plans for the people that were underneath the eclipse path, but ultimately... You know, we see a huge amount of traffic headed home. And if you look down in Florida, by the way, there was a lot of traffic going on down there. That wasn't to do with the eclipse. That was all about the sun and fun flying. I do somewhat uh, lament the fact that while I did see a total solar eclipse, I missed my last chance to fly a plane during a solar eclipse unless I get the skills to go elsewhere. But Montreal also, by the way, has some rocket teams. And I was really happy that people got in touch and managed to organize like a visit with uh, Concordia Space. They are a student rocket team at Concordia University and they are building a rocket to go above 100 kilometers. It's liquid fueled with kerosene and liquid oxygen pressurized by nitrogen. And they've been working on this for a few years with the hope that they may be the first student team to launch a liquid fueled rocket above 100 kilometers into space. It was fantastic to see something that was a student team building something this big and this capable. I, I really hope that I can maybe see the launch and maybe see them succeed in their quest. The other team I visited was Rock ETS. Rockets, right? Uh, ETS is like a French-speaking uh, engineering technical school in the, the town, in the city. And they primarily work in you know, carbon fiber composites and uh, solid rocket motors. They've launched rockets to like 30,000, 50,000 feet in competition. They're developing a hybrid engine right now. As you can see, they've won some prizes for their launches. And I will be honest, I barely had enough time to visit with these amazing people because it's fantastic to meet people that are doing this stuff for real and, and you're anticipating they may be doing this as a career going forwards. And I'm very likely to see all of these people again because you know what? My wife really wants to go back to Montreal. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. <laughs> <laughs>